I have an excellent um, group uh, of staff who work for me. That makes it sound like a lot. There's actually two full-time staff members. <laughs> <laughs> they cover a lot of ground, but um, they're really fantastic and, and we do what we can to um, ask questions and raise issues in the Parliament. And I think it's managed to fuel some of the ongoing debate in the local media that you've been running on it. Um, <clears throat> and those answers often do that. So it's a good example of, I guess, somebody from the community you know, saying, well, well, is there somewhere in the parliament where I can get my issues raised, that I can get these things um, addressed as much as they can be? And, and that's very much the way the Greens work. Um, we, I, I would argue more than any other political uh, party understand that you've got to maintain those links with the community um, and you've got to keep in, in, in touch with issues as they come up. My job is to try and uh, regain the uh, region, uh, get a seat for the, in the region for the Greens. And the region goes from Mandurah at the top to just east of Albany. Uh, so it's a very large area to cover. Um, but we've been uh, working hard to, to do that and um, uh, you know, are really uh, um, uh, positive about the response we're getting. Um, and I guess, uh, I don't think, I mean, the, the <coughs> The issues about services are, are, are replicated around the southwest. Um, there may be money coming in from all these regions, uh, and we would certainly say that that should continue. But that needs to be adjusted so it actually is about providing. Now they might have the infrastructure, but you don't have the psychiatrists or the uh, um, the doctors or the actual people to uh, service the growing community, and that's replicated all around the southwest. The issue of housing uh, and the lack of affordable either um, houses to buy or and certainly rental accommodation is right throughout the southwest. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and Michael touched on the forest issue. There's no doubt that uh, there's a real push to have this election also be about finally uh, having a phase out plan for native forest logging and move into plantation timbers. Uh, we've worked hard on the economics of that because you know, I, we think this is one of the Achilles heel of the sector, is that when you start to look at the finances, they don't stack up. Uh, and I've been able to do that partly because I chair uh, one of the parliamentary committees into state finances. And so we've targeted um, the, uh, the whole cost of logging of native forests, not just what the FPC uh, costs are, but the cost to deck, to manage it, and other um, uh, factors. It's quite hard to get in underneath it, but we've been working hard. Um, look, I might not, I mean, I could talk about numerous issues, but I think, I, I reckon if people have questions, um, Michael and I are both more than happy to, uh, to answer questions. Um, there are other issues we're running hard on. Uh, genetically modified um, crops is one where uh, there was a lot of anger about what's happened with GM crops in the Southwest, and that's certainly coming back um, to us to say run hard on that and we have a policy of uh, reinstating a moratorium on GM crops um, trying to put the uh, cat back in the bag so to speak I'll leave it at that <laughs> is what is like all the farmers are doing the canal and have put it so profitable what's well I'm um, interesting are they enough gonna like you or not uh, well interestingly enough um, our candidate for Warren Blackwood whose name's narrowly a uh, boss hammer who's a uh, works with the um, Southwest Catchment Council and spends a lot of time talking to farmers. Um, uh, says there's a lot of uh, anger in the farming community because, uh, for one, the premium that GM Canola was meant to provide isn't, uh, you know, isn't transpiring. And in fact, if you look at the price, there they're having to sell it for for a lower price. And this was always the argument that even again, if you just look at the economics of it, there's a premium. Um, that's paid for non-GM canola and um, because of the risk of contamination and other things and the market uh, for GM canola is, is at a lower price. So the GM canola that has been grown, they've had trouble selling um, at, a, at you know, the price they expect. Then you've got the situation with uh, Steve Marsh, who's the farmer just out of Kojana, whose uh, 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 organic farm was contaminated with GM canola. Uh, and his only recourse was to take his neighbour, who's a you know, um, lifetime friend, to court uh, for um, for damages to his uh, um, to his income, because he can't now sell his crop 
uh, as non-GM uh, and uh, there's very strict certification, he had uh, to sell his um, crop into the ordinary market, so he uh, had a reduced income. Uh, and that court case, interesting enough, is about to come up. Uh, and it'll be really uh, interesting to see how that unfolds. But I think there's a lot of anger. Um, the minister, Redmond, is seen as being cap captured by uh, the big in industrial side of agriculture. So it's not just the GM stuff. What farmers are saying is that we haven't got the support services that we used to have on farm in terms of advising us about um, you know, choices. Um, and the research capacity in the Department of Ag has been cut to the bone. And I know that from also talking to people who work in the department. Uh, so the push is for the big end, get big, get in industrial export to China, that's where everything's going, uh, as opposed to let's grow local, high value, um, regionally identified produce, uh, 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 which will uh, produce more local employment. So it's kind of the bulk Coles Woolies end of the, of the spectrum versus uh, the more differentiated product. And one of the reasons why we've been um, distributing um, uh, the calendars that we have, promoting local markets and local producers, uh, is because there's a real sea change or a real sort of watershed mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. in terms of how the southwest will go, what is the future for the southwest. Because the average age of a farmer in Western Australia, anybody here know what it is? Mm -hmm. 58. Yeah, yeah. 58. Uh, and there's a crisis. A um, lot of farmers uh, feeling they have to get out, their kids won't stay, don't want to stay on the farms, there's no money in it. Um, but coming kind of in underneath that is this sort of whole new excitement about um, a regional identity for produce, a higher value produce. And it's happening not just in Margaret River but also in places like Manjima. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we, one of the things we're doing is, is showcasing some of those new emerging businesses uh, because you know, funnily enough, the Greens aren't just about, you know, kind of uh, Tree the, 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 the standard environmental issues that we are known for. We also are really interested about the future of the region and, and how we continue to produce off the land in a kind of clean, green and, and um, sustainable way. That was a long answer, sorry. Who, just <laughs> Who asked that question? <laughs> Yeah, so that was one of the questions that was put very early on uh, when, <coughs> so in order to uh, lift the moratorium that uh, was put in place by ourselves and the Labour Party, basically the legislation, the law says that you can't grow GM crops in Western Australia. And the only way you can grow GM crops in Western Australia is if the uh, Parliament um, grants an exemption. And the exemption could be, you know, for a 10 hectare size or it could be for the whole state. And what the uh, Liberal Nationals did is um, bring that e exemption in. So that's why you can grow canola, whatever you want now. <clears throat> and what happened in uh, Williams is that uh, there was a truck that had a some sort of a, an accident in terms of it got heated and the uh, canola spread over quite a long bit of the highway there and of course when that area was tested a lot of the canola growing on the roadside is actually GM. Uh, now the responsibility for that cleanup interestingly enough rests with the Shire uh, and the Shire doesn't want to know about it um, and uh, the challenge with it is that it because it's uh, GM canola, you can't spray it with Roundup, it doesn't kill it. So they have to use more significant um, uh, chemicals to kill a GM uh, a crop because it's, um, it's its whole feature. You can spray the whole thing with Roundup and kill off all the weeds uh, and the canola keeps growing. So uh, yeah, that's that's been a, uh, I mean, bound to happen. I don't know if everybody knows what canola looks like. What do you think of poppy seeds? Uh, they're very light, they're very small. If you talk to the farmers, the level of um, contamination or spillage from canola is very high. Unless you're going to have a kind of positively, um, almost like transport it in a tanker like you would a liquid, um, some of it will spill. Um, so, and unfortunately what 
the industry, that is the GM industry, knows and is totally cynical about is that once it starts to be in the environment, then everybody just goes, it's too late. You know, it's happened. What can we do? Uh, but I don't think it's too late yet. Um, and certainly if there was a change of government and the Labour Party got in, they still have maintained their um, anti-GM stamp to their credit. And if it, between our combined numbers, we could probably uh, reinstate that ban. Um, and I think the backlashes will continue and it'll come from other farmers uh, as much as from the consumers. Uh, and the other point we are tackling it from is that from the labelling point of view, from the consumer's point of view, to try in the federal arena to ensure that there's truth in labelling. So that there isn't any tolerance in terms of GM content. It's got any GM content that has to be labelled in that way. But we know in products, you know, whether it's uh, corn syrup or soy products, that, that, that there is a GM uh, tolerance, which is especially in imported stuff. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I suppose just touching on, I thought the FPC and plantation of hardwood or of the saw logs was interesting. We asked a question earlier on this year, and I think it was what it was to do is um, I raised it, it was to do with now that we've got bushfire rating zones, we're having to use um, timbers that are, are regarded as bushfire resistant. And at, at the moment, there are no WA timbers which are bushfire resistant. So the common one used now is um, a timber called spotted gum, which you get from the eastern states. And spotted gum is actually a plantation timber, and we were growing it in WA. I think if, uh, I can't recall the year 2007. Uh, they st stopped funding the FPC plantings in about 2008. I think. 2008. So we, we had a potentially a growth industry there, um, saw log industry. Uh, the farmers could have you know, gained a, a cash crop. Um, uh, growing uh, uh, spotted gum, and they were keen to do so, uh, and the FPC had stopped it. And so basically now we've got this hole where a period now where no, none of these species have been planted, and so the capacity to actually transition from native logging to um, plantation timber is, um, has been weakened because of that. And it's not, I suppose, if you look at the argument, it's not an argument of whether um, should we log in native forests or shouldn't we? The time is coming where we won't be because the timbers just aren't there. And we're hearing stories now of, you know, one, one uh, load came through of 70% rejection. Um, plus we've got the issue of climate change where especially our northern Jarrah forests are getting absolutely uh, caned by the lack of rainfall. And I suppose to put it into context is that uh, Jarrahs usually grow in a, a rainfall area of around 600 millimetres per year. Now, at Cape Naturalist, we average about 840 mil a year up until about two th year 2000. In the last 12 years, we've averaged 640 and we're falling. So the scope of area where jarrahs are going to possibly survive in the future is diminishing rapidly. So it's, if you were to look at the industry and say, if you were in that industry and you said, you want a future, logging jarrah in native forests is on a short leash as far as time goes, and they need to transition out of it. And at the moment, they've got their head in the sand and they're choosing not to. Yet, you've got the agricultural industry wanting to take on that role, um, and the government just not being proactive in making sure that transition comes about. Yeah, the, um, <coughs> the FPC's role was to, um, uh, to Forest Products Commission. So they um, uh, manage the logging of native forests as well as they did manage plantations. They still have a role in pine plantations, yeah. but what they stopped doing is funding any planting activity. And of course, if you're going to develop an on-farm uh, timber industry, you need to have a consistent supply. So there was plantings that took place over 10 years. Um, a fair chunk of federal money was also introduced to do that. And in fact, the spotted gums are doing very nicely, having been out and uh, walked around them with the Forest Products uh, Commission. Um, but as soon as they stopped planting in 2008, you've kind of got a gap in your uh, your you know your, your product as it, as, it, as it becomes to uh, maturity. You made that move to uh, decline those leases, yeah. but the companies still have still own. You know, they're still sitting there. They haven't disappeared anywhere. Um, and and those who follow the regular emails from Brent Watson who did a fantastic <laughs> job on that campaign, you know that that's still 
sitting there. Uh, and if you had a change of attitude by a future mining minister, it could be changed overnight. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like when uh, the Liberals got in and uh, changed overnight their position on uranium mining by a stroke of a pen. Uh, so it doesn't have to go through Parliament, it doesn't have to be debated or anything, it could just be changed. Uh, whether they've got the political kind of gumption to do that, we don't know. But, uh, and one of the ongoing issues down there, of course, if you own land within that coal, coal mining area, um, the ability to get loans, and that is really restricted because the banks look at it and say, well, you the can't. value of your land is actually plummeting because it could be mined at any time. There's this element of unsurety about its future, mm -hmm. which is actually making its life really difficult for yeah. a few of the people down there. The capacity to borrow money to pursue their agricultural mm -hmm. Um, What's the term that Brent called that? Decapitalising yes. or something? Yeah, I can't remember. It's like if your neighbour moved in and did something that completely trashed the value of your house and you've got no recourse. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. On that note, if it's yeah. really That's scary. Yeah. And um, if we don't start planning and doing it now, um, we are going to be you know, really behind the eight ball um, in terms of war. Uh, so, uh, is there still a risk in Barcelona of the, um, the mining coal seam? Oh, coal seam gas, so with fracking, is um, in this area because of the Sioux coal seam, which runs basically from Siesta Park right through down to Augusta. Um, that's coal seam gas. Um, Titan Energy did have, uh, still have leases. Um, we're going to do exploration, but we've actually pulled out now. So, at this stage, no. Um, I suppose that draws on to another discussion about um, protection of agricultural and tourist areas from whether it be coal seam gas and fracking and from mining. Um, at the moment, uh, Margaret Cole's not going ahead because the minister has said um, so we won't proceed with that. But that's the only protection we've got. So if we get a, we are getting a new minister actually at the next election because Norman Moore is retiring. We've just got to rely on that minister to uphold that um, rejection of. Uh, mining mm. in Margaret River. Right. Now, coal seam gas and fracking actually come under the Petroling Act, which is a different act to the Mining Act. So, um, yeah, look, there's a whole there's a whole discussion, and Giz introduced legislation into the Parliament with regards to what's called the Mining Community Protection um, Amendment Bill. And what it was was to give local councils the op the capacity to their town planning schemes to override. The Mining Act. So what could happen is, a, say, City of Boston could say, look, Margaret River, oh, sorry, the yelling up Dunsborough area and right through to Carbonup is too precious as an agricultural area and a tourist area, and we want to maintain it like that. Therefore, we'll put that in our town planning scheme and you can't mine it. At the moment, the Mining Act takes precedence. So they can go down there and mine it, and the councils might have it zoned as, you know, tourist. And, you have a mind and everyone should watch that video. I can't remember the Gas name. Gasland. Yeah. Gas yeah. yeah, they so, really so, should yeah. and know exactly what happened. So in WA, Margaret River is probably one of the few areas where, where coal seam gas fracking was a possibility. And at the moment, for commercial reasons, it's probably been pushed off as a chance now. But certainly, it's only the um, financial aspect of it and whether they find a, a lucrative seam or not to do And I it. reckon they've got to get yeah. in quick because they will ban it. And yeah. if they don't yeah. get in quick and There's get their little happening. holes yeah. Yeah. drilled... And, but in the Perth Basin up in Yabba, there is actually... Um, coal, it's not coal seam gas, it's um, shale, shale gas. gas. Um, and they're fracking for shale gas up there. And it actually happens quite close, up at the Witcher Range. Um, they pumped over a million litres of diesel into the um, wells up there oh. when they fracked. Well. And that's down there, they didn't get it back. Um, it, and actually I've spoken to the current Witcher Range energy people and they're planning to do more work up there but they're not fracking. And the problem they had up there was because it was, um, there's clay in the, uh, it's tight gas up there it's called, it's very dense and there's, and there's a bit of clay in the rock formations. When they fracked, Clay expanded and just shut it all down. So and so they wrecked it. They actually they destroyed their well by fracking it. So the new guys going in, to their credit, uh, they, they won't refuse to frack it. Yet. 
But I, I don't know what stage they're at or what they've got planned up there. Look, I say the thing that the, 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 well, I haven't noticed that with the price on carbon that he, he's uh, made any changes. Um, but Michael's right. I mean, and again, out in the farming community, um, if if there is a relatively small amount of assistance, there are a lot of farmers who are looking to diversify their income uh, to uh, actually um, set up a local industry like a sawmill. Cranbrook or one of those sort of areas where a lot of that planting has occurred to uh, make good sawn timber or good quality uh, um, laminate and that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, unless you've got a critical mass, you can't actually start putting in the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't got to that critical, critical mass yet. Yeah. I think yeah. the farmers too don't know what to do to tree or go back to farming. Yeah. Well, and a lot of them are in so much serious debt that it's, it's really hard. And again, you know, some of the things that we've been looking at is the kind of big picture stuff like the role of the big supermarkets in terms of determining prices. That's what, apart from the deregulation that occurred in the dairy sector, mm -hmm. those that have managed to stay in there are now being hammered by this uh, price war between yeah. Coles and Woolworths. Yeah. And um, I've also been speaking to um, a woman called Sue Middleton, who's a very inspiring uh, farmer out at Wongan Hills, actually, but she uh, won an Australian you know, Rural Woman of the Year award a couple of years ago, and trying to uh, diversify their product. They grow pigs and they grow oranges, I think they grow olives or something like that. And she said their biggest impediment is the major supermarkets, because they won't um, allow them to differentiate their product. They just want masses of stuff at the cheapest amount. So there are structural things that are making it hard for even the farmers who are trying to, um, you know, because he's growing like organic pork, uh, they, 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 the big buyers, the big retail buyers, you know, don't want a differentiated product. They just want lots of, you know, what they can sell cheaply. So there's a real kind of battleground out there in terms of what farming is going to look like in, in Western Australia. Uh, and I think, you know, farmers are, you know, they, are really uh, looking for an alternative kind of uh, direction than what's being offered by uh, by the nationals, actually, in terms of a kind of a get big or get out argument. I think it's very important there's an ABC of agriculture, like ABC Television, you know, separate media, government media, and we need government agricultural department shopping centre outlets as well, maybe. Like it doesn't help that the department has been cut heavily in terms of its. Uh, uh, budget cuts and uh, the morale in the Department of Agriculture and Food is very low um, and uh, uh, they only have prospect of more of the same. And in some respects it's kind of also a victim of the, uh, of the, the, the split economy, the mining economy versus everything else. Um, and so they lose people to the mining sector, then they get you know, cuts and so it's a very emaciated organisation. It's more or less a marketing arm which is only part, I mean, nothing wrong with marketing, it's an important part of the thing, but it's only part of it. Well, on agriculture, I suppose everyone's familiar with deregulation of the milk industry and the fact that now that farmers are getting less at the farm gate for their milk than they And not only that, this WA is no longer even supplying or producing enough of its own milk for its own market now. Um, so that's been a, a real tragedy. Um, and that's been forewarned for, year, for a couple of years now, and it's now actually starting to happen where we're importing milk because we do not produce it enough locally. Yeah, so it wasn't that long ago. The, Sorry? That's all the dehydrated and reformed yeah. low yeah. fat, all this stuff that's really bad. And it wasn't long ago we were looking at the dairy industry actually being a, an export industry. Yeah. Um, well, and the other factor happening yeah. there, Michael, of course, is the, is the buying up by. Chinese uh, yeah. uh, companies, yes. and all, you've got to remember all Chinese companies are actually at least partially government owned, yeah. so they're like the Chinese government. And then uh, the uh, pressure to produce powdered milk to export, yeah. a direct chain just straight through to... Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, it's, it's a pretty yeah. fast moving and extraordinary mm. times and yeah. uh, you know again the, the minister has basically said um, you shouldn't be afraid of foreign investment, it's all good. Um, and interestingly enough some farmers have been quite, on the one hand this, on the other hand that about it, because at least someone's injecting capital into the into their uh, their assets. They're providing a, an alternative um, 
purchaser of yeah. their milk and other than the yeah. cold worse. But also in terms of yeah. buying the properties, they're stabilising yeah, yeah. out, true, stabilizing yeah. out the kind of crash in the value of, of yeah. farming properties. Yeah. So, and but then, yeah. and the <laughs> next what one cost? is um, deregulation of the potato industry is coming up in this election too. The Labor have said they want to deregulate the potato mm -hmm. industry, um, which actually puts the Greens in a, in a power position on this one because. I was speaking to a potato farmer about it. He says, oh, it's a formality. The industry will be deregulated. I said, well, no, it won't. Because Labor will never, I can't see in any time in the future, Labor getting into power in this state and having control of the upper house. The Greens will have the balance of power. So the Greens are in a position to actually dictate terms in deregulation of the potato industry and attempt to prevent those problems which have gone into the, um, the dairy industry, so that's an interesting interesting one coming up too. Well, on the, Giz mentioned earlier about the effort to showcase businesses that are really thriving and doing well and, and that are sustainable ones, and the, uh, while, you're, while we're discussing dairy, the, the amazing story of, of Bannister Downs milk. Yeah. Okay, so the, as we know, the dairy crashed everywhere. Um, Bannister, meanwhile, is selling their milk top dollar. They do not budge on price, and they are thriving. Mm -hmm. And they, 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 they're the ones in the in the soft pouch. Mm -hmm. They have this. Uh, they, they manage their dairy in a in a an organic, holistic way, and and the milk's great, and everybody loves it, and they're, they're doing very nicely. Thank you very much. We buy. It. So they're, they're <laughs> yeah, we buy it too. So it, it's a great example of. of of a, of a green enterprise, and, you know, it's, it's the way of the future. So the, they're the only people making money in the dairy industry. Really. Yeah. Are the top end products that are, or in all the niche markets that are in the cheeses and so on, especially on the south coast, and and they're doing quite nicely. So yeah, it can be done. Yeah. Good to see. One I didn't touch on too is um, the container deposit scheme. I think that's mm. one where it needs to kick along. Um, South Australia have it in. Yep. Um, I keep hearing stories about people coming from South Australia and they don't see near or any of the rubbish they see on the roads and beaches we see here. Um, that's that's a. It was actually uh, legislation was put forward in the federal parliament and knocked back by um, Liberal and Labor Party. Mm -hmm. And we've Why did actually. They knock it back. The pressure, the pressure of the um, of the packaging industry. They're effect. powerful. They're, they are incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, now who's, it's Vizzy isn't it, yeah, Vizzy. their packaging company, and have you ever seen their trucks, they've got a great big picture of a rainforest yeah. on the side, <laughs> I just go, oh! <laughs> <laughs> no, probably Coca-Cola Amateur are the main, they're probably the biggest ones, because yeah. Northern Territory is, and Vizzy, um, oh, Coca-Cola, yeah parts of Northern, well. sorry, yeah. Vizzy's a monopoly, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, Northern Territory introduced, I think there's some areas in Darwin, or well, Darwin might have introduced, um, Container deposit scheme and Coca Cola have taken to court. Really? Yeah, just trying to close them down. Oh, yeah. And the South Australian government have actually fought various attempts to close them down, including attempts to bulk truck um, containers into the state from other states just to try and wreck their yeah. system. Um, they've managed to hold it up. Um, WA is in a great position where, because we've got South Australia doing it, we don't have that risk. Um, uh, but we're not interested in doing it. The WA, I don't know if you've seen the, um, the ads in our local paper where the local government association put full page ads assessing uh, different parties' policies and given the Greens big ticks on each item and one of those is container deposit scheme. And the reason being is that um, glass in the waste stream is really costly for local government. One, it goes in a landfill, but also it contaminates their um, recyclables. So when they go and assess their recyclables, of course if it's dumped in the back of the truck, it's smashed up and all of a sudden they're trying to work through their recyclables with all this broken glass through their recycling. So again, it's it's part of, if you have that container deposit scheme, remove all the aluminium and the glass out of the system and all of a sudden the recycling actually becomes more viable. So there's a few... few hits on Can I just throw in there too? I mean, it is one of the things that we do uh, really well is working with local government. Uh, we recognise that local government has some really significant roles to play and our relationship with the you know, WA Local Government um, Association is really good um, and the recycling is one but also you reminded me um, some of the um, 
changes that are happening in terms of a lot of uh, um, uh, cost saving and energy saving with introduction of solar on things like the Bunbury Sports Complex has just Hello. in the last six months put in a, a solar system mm. on its roof um, and it is uh, an extraordinarily efficient um, a solar hot water system uh, and yeah. I've now been talking to the Mandurah um, Council, the Albany Council about similar um, enterprises and they've been kicked along because in the federal parliament when the package went through with the Greens and the ALP for price on carbon there was these additional uh, provisions around that and one of that was to provide funds for local councils to um, do energy saving uh, greenhouse reducing projects so they're doing two main things seem to be putting solar on their all their heating and swimming pools and sports complexes were actually quite a big chunk of of, uh, of money and also greenhouse gas uh, and changing street lights to LEDs um, and uh, in fact the person who kind of did a lot of the work in WA Local Government Association uh, left and is now working for one of my colleagues, Robin Chappell. So we've got a really good you know, basis to work with local councils, supporting their applications um, and that kind of thing. So you know, there are some things changing uh, with that link between what we'll be able to do in the federal parliament and what's happening with local authorities. And it's, it'll actually save ratepayers too. So yeah. people will start to see, oh yes, this price in carbon actually might save us on our rates, uh, you know, they, in fact, Bunbury, the, the, what they're seeing is that the uh, uh, the estimated um, saving has already been eclipsed uh, quite considerably. So, so it's pretty exciting, really, and it's kind of a no-brainer, actually. <laughs> you know, why would you heat your massive swimming pools with uh, with electricity rather than using photovoltaic? Um, well, it's not photovoltaic; it's thermal yeah. technology. Yeah. Well, Dunsville Primary School, we've transferred all our lighting across to LEDs. And um, yeah, we'll be doing some work on the numbers to see how much money we're saving, but we're expecting to save the order of eight to ten thousand a year um, just by making that move. And they have to get these stories out there, yeah. so people know that yeah. this is actually it's, it's actually a win-win, not a not a terrible impost on us. Yeah. Uh, you know, but but often people don't know these these sort of uh, uh, good news stories.